what this did is we started a new project. And by just doing a file new, we named our project, just click on Jumpstart Demo at the top. Kind of, th that filled out our team number. We picked our export directory, which uh, we just left as default. <coughs> and essentially that was the, the end of that. In our subsystems, when we started uh, thinking about our robot, right on day one, you know your robot's gonna have a drivetrain. You may not know exactly what the wheelbase is gonna be, or what type, if you're mechanums or a regular uh, differential drive, but it's gonna have drive, so you can start to mock this stuff out and lay the pattern this stuff in. So we drug in a drivetrain. Over here is a kind of a tool palette where we have our different subsystems, uh, drivetrain types, inputs, actuators, pneumatics, as well as some commands, and that's what we hope to get to today in this, in this next section right here. So we, we drug one in where you can go over in your subsystem and right click. <coughs> and we added a subsystem, and we right clicked on the subsystem, we added a controller, and those are all from that purple area. Add another controller real quick. Uh, no, like uh, add controllers, add a uh, tube robot drive controller. See, and then what happens here is this has error correcting. So there's a problem here. We can click on that and it'll show us what our problems are. We have to put the motors inside of this. So we start error checking and it starts assigning ports to it so we can manually check, uh, assign those ports. So delete that out of this. Once we set up our drivetrain, we set up a PID type of controller. That needed a potentiometer or some other encoder type of input and a motor. We assigned those to the inputs and outputs. The hot motor, they showed up in these little drop lists. And your drop lists are always gonna be populated with exactly what you what are allowed to have in there. Not like you're not gonna be able to put an input where an output belongs. Operating interface, you're always you typically all of us we run the same drive things year after year. We have one joystick, two joysticks. You can start to lay lay that stuff down by adding joysticks to our operator interface section. Well, welcome. And then our joysticks are gonna have buttons, so we can start mapping our buttons. Everybody here know how to find what button is pressed when you push the button A, how what what button number that is? Anybody not know how that how to find that? So I'll bring up a driver station. When you have a driver station installed, you have this uh, little tab over here on the USB. Is that not plugged in? Is it? Oh yeah, no joystick needs to be. Plug in a joystick in there. And you don't even maybe have to be hooked up to a robot here. You can be completely offline. You hook your joystick stick into your. There should be three of them on one side. Yeah, you don't even have to be hooked up to a robot to, to get this part to work. Joystick there. So over here in USB. You have a list of all the joysticks that are uh, that have been or are connected. Right here, the joystick number zero is plugged in right now. It's just hitting button A, and right there, button one is turning on. So you can hit button B, button two. You can start to rifle through all the different combinations and start to figure out the buttons. As well as the joysticks, you'll need to know these axis numbers, zero through five. So you start moving your joystick up, down, left, right. And you'll notice that when he pushes uh, the number one up, it goes negative. Up and so Kind of make note of that, so when you're programming things, you're like, okay, up, which you kind of think would be a positive direction, slide forward, is actually coming back to the code as a negative number. So, and all this stuff, this scale, this is at zero, and we just go, it returns a one uh, analog value from zero to one, or zero to negative one, or 100% to negative 100%. And your POV, all the different buttons, you can figure out north, south, east, west. POV is very special on the Xbox controller, and it takes a little bit of a, decoding to successfully use that button. After we created that, uh, those interfaces, we created some general commands. So like with the, uh, this is where we're gonna leave, take off right now, is this, my drive with joysticks. We created, and I like to add the my in front there, so when IntelliSense starts, when you start typing, you can start, oh, this, I'm gonna use a method or a, that I created, I just type my, and the, uh, the IDE or whatever developer you're using will start to, Auto populate. What are you trying to get at? So all your stuff pops to the top really quickly. Yes. So this is all within Microsoft Visual. This right here is an application all by itself. Okay. Uh, this is called Robot Builder. Well, Robot Builder will build the backbone to create all this code for the the the, the structure of the the boilerplate 
code for us that we can now insert some advanced stuff. What that's the one thing that this does do is, in that first class, we can, we can maybe skip back to that when we finish this, is we had the PID controller, and what the PID is proportional integral derivative, is this we call a risk. Like if we want to move out something in our, on our robot to multiple positions, we can't use pneumatics, we're gonna stop somewhere in the middle. We have a motor, and on the back side here is a potentiometer measuring voltage of it, and we're kind of translating that over to the degrees. And so we can say go to, and this is right now it's at 90 degrees, it's at 180, and we get some offsets in there as well. Go to 90, it's gonna go to 90. Go to 45, it'll go to 45. We did all of that without writing a single line of code over here in VS Code, because the robot builder created all that boilerplate tools for us. And is that like part of the FRC suite download? It's built right in, yeah, it'll be, it'll be installed right with your one-click installer. When you, this year when, as the transition to VS Code, you'll, you'll download the VS Code and, or the WPI installer, and that will install all these tools for you. The only extra installs you'll have to do is if you want to use Git, you're going to have to install the Git SEM for Windows or your platform, so you can use Git. Otherwise, when you do try to do a git push or pull, VS Code says, I cannot find, uh, find the, git, the git commands. So you have to do that external installation. As well as if you're using cross world electronics, NavX, or other third party hardware that, that they have their own libraries for, that you have to bring into your project. You have to install their tools as well. Cross world electronics is almost a, a must install third party, just so you can get on your CAN bus this year and diagnose any CAN issues or look at your TDP, look at your pneumatic control modules, set uh, node numbers and that kind of thing. <coughs> you get, yeah, I think I covered it? Yeah. Okay, good. So <clears throat> in the, then what we do with our commands is you can see in that drive hand, requires, we can say it requires a drivetrain. What that requires does is we have two different drives here. We drive with joysticks and my drive time. If my drive time is initiated, it's going to cancel the drive with joysticks and take over because it also requires the drive frame. Only one command can be acting upon a subsystem at one time. So the last command that says, hey, I need you, is going to cancel the last the one that's currently running and take over. So once we did all that, we set this all up here, up in uh, my drive trains, what we did next is we did one more final step right there is we set a default command with drive with joysticks. When our robot is sitting there doing nothing, probably what we want to be doing is being controlled by the joysticks. If we hit a button that says it's going to take some, do some autonomous motion, it's going to disconnect the joysticks and do its, do its job. But when it's done, it's going to return the, the return control to the default command, which is return joysticks. It is kind of automatically for us. Once we did that, we saved. We hit this little Java button up here. We, we clicked on it, and we won't get the prompt anymore. But when you click on that, it's gonna, the little hourglass is going to come up and it's going to pop up said, code has been created. Uh, open it up in VS Code, and you can start in inputting your logic in there. What we did after that <coughs> is we kind of ex explored a little bit. We have, these, we have some buckets right here, commands. Were, all of our commands will be in this little bucket here, nicely organized. And you can see, like, when I do my drive, now I know it's my command that I created. Drive just kind of tells me it's going to be acting upon the drivetrain <laughs> subsystem and the kind of little description, time with joysticks. And you got my wrist. Now I know this command is actually acting upon the wrist subsystem. So having just some kind of naming convention that logically when you just look at the name of the command, that's what it's doing. You know, you could have command one, command two, command three, and it would be very helpful. And then our subsystems was created. Yes, we should do this. In our subsystem was created, this is all boiler, but we haven't typed anything in here yet, even in the last class. We declared some of the variables that are going to be used in this subsystem. We initiated all of our motors, and we had a little conversation before that there is some chatter up there that this is not the right way to do it. With First Robotics, to get it running and working again, it works very well for us, and it gets us quickly into running our robot code. When we get out to the industry, these things will not necessarily be initiated inside of our subsystems. They should be actually injected through our constructor. There's a great video series that, uh, I have his name written down here, so I always forget it, but Spartan Robotics Team 997, Chuck Benedict. Uh, he's doing some...
kind of breaking, breaking apart this command base profile and saying, hey, there's a little bit better way of doing this. But it's advanced coding. So it's definitely worth a, a, a watch. There's some links on Chief Delphi on that. So this created our, initiated our motor. These add child bits, they're adding functionality and pushing it up to our smart dashboard so we can run the robot. And so continue to create our drivetrain. We in injected our motors into the drivetrain. It automatically set our defaults. And um, to, to note, you see this begin auto generated and uh, auto generated. Robot Builder is uh, in control of everything in between here right now. If we write some custom code inside here, next time if we go to Robot Builder and re hit that Java button, it's going to overwrite what we just did and it's lost. You could write your life story inside one of those things. You hit uh, generate Java, it's gone. So you definitely, when, if you might need to be in this method, but you just got to make sure you're outside of these areas. If you still want to use uh, Robot Builder later on, but you say, I don't want Robot Builder to con have uh, control of this section anymore, you delete these two lines. When Robot Builder comes in here to inject the code, it's going to look for those two things and hey, it's missing. It's going to say, I don't know what, you are controlling that section now. Uh, so in the, we're in the subsystem. In the subsystem, we have a periodic method. When this subsystem is actuated every 20 milliseconds or roughly so, this method is being called and any code we're doing in there, maybe checking encoders, doing some background information, something we might want to push up to the smart dashboard, could live inside there. You know, it might be better to create a, a, me a private method that's doing all that smart dashboard checking and call that private message from inside there. And then down here, we did start writing this. This would not have been here. here. This is where we start to create our code. Uh, quickly, let's go back, or let's go to the, my wrist. Same thing at the top. Declare the variables, uh, initiate the variables, and, and create the, the PID controller. Uh, created our pot, added the pot to the smart dashboard to use motors. Keep on scrolling down. We did not write any of this code inside in here. There is no default commands for this one. We got to return the potentiometer for our PID controller to use and the motor output that the PID controller is going to say, okay, you need to go at 100% one direction or not. It's all been taken care of there. This, this is a quick review. Go to robot.io. OI. This is where all those buttons that we created and we've mapped button D while held. We'll set the wrist to 45 degrees. Smart dashboard buttons. So now this has all been auto-generated. And then inside of our robot, uh, this is the, if you've been doing the interim robot programming, this is very, should seem very similar. Here we're actually at the top declaring our different subsystems and parts of the robot. In the robot init, we're initiating a new instance of the drivetrain of the risk of the OI. The OI, and there's very good instructions in here to read. The OI must be constructed after your subsystems because you might be using something that inside the OI that those dependencies have to be alive on. Set your auto choosers and so on right there. Uh, we should go to risk to set point. All of our methods have an, a, a constructor up here where we've created this internal variable and actually Robot Builder did all of this for us right here. When we initialize, every subsystem or command has an initialize. The initialize is ran one time when the, you initialize the command and then it goes into the execute or the execute there again runs every 20 milliseconds running maybe updating joystick commands to your motors. The is finished, when, when this returns true, the command is finished and the end command is called where we would clean up, maybe shut off motors, set some variables that we need to uh, set for later on. If another command outside says, hey, I want that subsystem, I'm taking over, it's going to call the interrupted method. And typically what we do inside there, and since this is the risk to set point, we, we left this alone, we would call the end. Because if we're interrupted, we likely will have to do the same thing. But if there's a situation where if we're interrupted, we want to do this. But if we end it, we want to do that. That's how we could write a different set of boiler, a different set of codes. So we're going to go in right now into that drive with joysticks. So you got, you got the shuffleboard up? 
to do shuffleboard. I'm going to assume that we have written no code. Shuffleboard is open. Driver station's up. Just with that boilerplate robot builder, we've created all of our all this information, all this the, the backbone of our code. We're going to go into test mode. A live window. Do a new live window. It created all these little widgets for us on our dashboard. We haven't written any code yet. So right now we can uh, run our motor, see if our drive train, if our left motor is our left motor. If forward is forward, backwards is backwards, right motor is right motor. Right motor, right motor. So let me decouple this PID so we can test that motor. Run the wrist motor. The wrist motor is positive going counterclockwise. We, we can now see is our PID controller positive motor the same direction as our positive pot? So there's a negative direction, there's a positive direction. And we can use this, and we can use this right little widget right here to tune the PID controller. We can actually start putting uh, different P values in there, different set point values, and see if this thing actually works and we want to make sure it's not. And we did all that in the last class. Now we'll go back over, disable the robot. So with no code, we have a PID controller running. Now we just have to start actually writing some of our own code, some of our own methods, and actually act upon the drivetrain and map them to our joystick. So the first thing we did is we went to the drivetrain subsystem, and we created this public void. We're not returning anything. We want to expose it to the world, but we're not going to return any values. My drive arcade, because we like to drive arcade our, on our team. We called and said, our drive, there's, a, there's an object at the top called drivetrain. That's where our our two motors are hooked up to, dot arcade drive. And the arcade drive requires two variables. It needs a speed and a rotation. So what we did is we copied, copied you can just highlight those two things. We copied those two items, put them into our method right up there. We pasted them into the method up there, and we declared those as doubles, saying this method needs two doubles at, the, at these values. We hit save. And this is right where we left off in the, we left off in the, the class. Drive with joysticks uh, command. Carry on. So here's where we're, we're going to start looking. At the top, initialize. Is there something we need to do when the drive with joysticks turns on? No, not likely. We're going to typically focus on that execute. So in the execute, we're going to start writing some uh, code to send values to our drivetrain subsystem. So right there, we're going to do robot dot my drive train dot my drive arcade. You see that my, how it just kind of, when you start to, it just populates right there, so, hey, these are my things. And when we hit enter, it says, hey, look at that, we need a speed and a rotation. We can copy those two uh, variables, just paste them right above that line inside the, no, not in there. Hit enter once and paste them right there. Create, put them on two different lines though. and declare them as doubles, put a double in front of each one. And that one is a double. And now we can say, we're gonna set the values of these. Yeah, the question. Quick refresher, what are doubles? Double <coughs> is, a, is, a, is a, it's like a real, a floating value, it can be any okay. decimal point. So I think in C++ that it might actually quite be literally labeled uh, are they reels over there? Or float, they're floats there, I think. Oh, okay. So, it's a variable, it's a, it's a number type. You can have integers, which are no decimal points. Yeah, I'm used to Python, so transferring over is weird. Yeah, but it, 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 it's just, yeah, it's syntax at this moment, at this point, you're gonna be, you'll be successful at it. So X speed, we're gonna go get our joystick controller. So on X speed, we're gonna set that equal. Any other questions before we? I'm moving along quick, but I wanna make sure we get this all in there. I can talk fast, like I kind of proved on that last session, which I apologize for if you're in. Where do we, do you have that page number in the room? Robot, so we're gonna call it robot oi dot get my joystick. Or that, no, it's not get, it's just my joystick, yep. My joystick dot get raw axi. And this is that, where that information is. Which one was that up one, and I believe get raw axis. It was axis one when we pushed up. That's where we want our speed to come from. And you can see how you put a little negative sign in front of that. 
because we made a note that negative or up is uh, negative, so we want to multiply it and we want to invert it. And then we're going to get our rotation. We're going to move our rotation over to the left or the right hand. And we're going to put that on axis four and close those with semicolons when they're done. Question? No? So now when we when this command, because this command is our default, it's always going to be running. Anytime we do some joystick motion, it's going to start uh, updating our motor control. It's never going to finish because we're always driving unless somebody cancels it through the interrupted. And what we already added down here is if somebody interrupts us, we probably want to shut our drivetrain off for some reason and let that guy take over. What happens if something interrupted and that's not going to actually do any updates on the drivetrain? Whatever speed and direction that robot's going, it's going to continue that direction until it hits a wall, breaks through, and goes into the audience. And we also made the end set the speed. So, yeah. And then the, the, on the end, since if somebody interrupts us, we definitely want to do that same thing, so we set it to end. So with this, also, uh, we got one, two, three, four, five, and about six, seven, eight lines of code. We are now ready to drive a robot. We want to save. Deploy. It fails the first time sometimes. I found it. Yeah, we'll do that after uh, once we get this deployed. and start using the joystick there to and uh, control and running. Good? Good? Let's go look at that Let's other, other, uh, uh, that other command that we created, uh, drive, time. drive time. There is a, a, a time command that would be more appropriate in this situation, but I wanted a demo without using encoders how this uh, injecting some uh, variable into it would work. So when we call this drive time, it requires a variable, a double timeout, and we set that timeout, and this has all been auto-generated. We set our internal private variable to m timeout. What we're going to want to do with that is underneath, go down, right, go to the end of that right there, create another line right there. We're gonna set, and this is special this time. We're gonna go, e or we're gonna go, set timeout equal to m underscore timeout. Set timeout uh, method inside uh, the command that we can utilize. Uh, change the capital T. Uh, set timeout. When we initialize, we're not gonna do anything. But down in the execute, we're gonna add. The robot dot my drive chain dot my drive arcade, but this time we're not going to use joystick values. We're just going to hard in this situation we're going to hard code it. But if we wanted to inject other variables, we could. We're going to set the speed to 0.5 and the rotation to uh, zero, so it just drives straight for whatever time we enter. Two commas there. The is finished. This is where you maybe go get your encoder counts. So we're going to delete that false and is finished. And right now, since we have a timeout, we're going to set that to is timeout, is timed out. I think it's going to need the brackets. Yeah, so is time. So when that timeout expires, is finished is going to be called. And this is where we need to clean up. And in our end, we're going to shut. So we can copy that robot drivetrain up there. Paste it in the end. It take our and set it to zero. Interrupted. Call the end. So this is with or without encoders. This is without encoders. This is just a timer. It would be way better to have encoders up there. It'd be more logical. But this is just to demonstrate how the it, uh, is finished works. Awesome. Save. Download. Robot Builder actually put a button up on our driver station that we can execute the uh, drive with time. So once we execute this, we'll enable the robot and one of those buttons on the shuffleboard tab 
we can test this command. We probably wouldn't have it mapped to a button. This is going to be more of an autonomous type of thing. We'd use an auto chooser, to, and it would be stitched together, and we'll do that here next. Tele up, enable, smart dashboard tab. Drive time, the second one. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five. We can continue. We can now stitch that together and start running commands, either parallel or sequential. Skip anything, anything there, Agent? No, okay. So now it comes. So now it comes kind of the command-based robot. Is we're going to start to disable the robot. I typically don't use Robot Builder too much to do this. The first time you might want to build it for to get the template, but we're going to create what's called a command group. This is where we're going to start bringing in all the different commands we are and recycle them and use them to uh, perform an autonomous routine. Our code last year had 19 autonomouses. And each autonomous had probably three different variables that it could do from within its own auto. So, did you create a command group? Yeah. This is the part of the soul. You just leave it command group one. <laughs> this is where it's okay here. We're gonna start stitching together. Did you already drag that in? Yeah, okay. I created that. I we're gonna start. A, we're gonna start a. We're gonna start an auto routine that's gonna make sure the wrist is up. Okay, we'll just kind of make sure our wrist was in the beginning set up. We're gonna drive forward for a, a given amount of time, then we're gonna put our wrist down. Drive forward for a given amount of time, put the wrist back up while we're driving forward, and then drive forward some time and put our wrist in the mid position. So this is this sequence. The first thing we're going to do is we, he did an add sequential, uh, wrist to position, and we can double click on that. And from before, we had presets in there. So we want to stow our wrist. And it, it happened to be at zero, so that not much happened there. Right click on that, and then do, we're going to add sequential. Drive for time. Uh, we defined default. We, we defined default, but let's put a different variable in there. Let's put uh, 10 seconds right there. So it's going to drive for a long time. And then we're going to do an add sequential wrist down. And then we're going to do it for another drive for time, add sequential, or no, this is it. Yeah, it's drive time, I forgot about that. Okay, add sequential, drive for time. Drive for time. We'll go five seconds. We'll go five time. seconds this time. We're going to scoop something off the ground. We could manually type in five there, so we'll just pick these balls. And now we're going to do what? And one. now we're going to do what? After, after we're going to do, after we drive for that five seconds, we're going to do two time. things at one time. We're going to add parallel. We're going to add parallel. Risk the set point. And we're going to scoop it up, so we're going to bring it, we're going to set that to up or still. And then an add, sequential, let me change the Drive for time. Drive for time. You see how it kind of stacked, see how it kind of stacked them up. This is how they're going to work. The, for the, how, long this, how long should we run this one for? After it's up. After it's up. Another five. Another five. Take five. Take five and the final, and the final we're, gonna we're gonna add another one more sequential. Dry our first dry in our first in it. Some of the gotchas some of the gotcha that get you inside, inside of this is when you do a parallel, when you do a parallel all those operations all those are gonna, operations are gonna execute, execute, at, the execute, time, execute at the same time. But if it's the sequential, so, sequential, so, when, so when, when, when you have, when it will get it in the code, you'll have add parallel, add parallel. The very next add sequential is where it will stop. It will run all that stuff at the same time. If that add sequential completes before everything else completes, and that's a bad thing, it will move on. Those will continue to operate. But it will move on through your code. So if you need to have something absolutely in the right position before you move on, you'll have to manually add. It's not in here. Uh, we add another sequential wait for children. And that's just going to make sure everything above it is completed before you move on. That's kind of one of those pro tips. So save, push the Java. Nice graphical user interface. I don't really care for it as much, but it definitely gets the point across. If we look at that new command group that was just created right there for us, and scrolling down. This is where we just we add sequential new wrist to set point, add sequential drive, add sequential, add sequential, add parallel wrist to set point, add sequential. No, go down, no, 
Got to go up one. Yep, we do. That's where we'll do that right now. We'll go down underneath that sequential. Yep. Right there. If that, if we need to make sure that wrist is in a spot before that timer times out, we're gonna have to add sequential. Keep on, just follow the syntax above it. New, wait for, if you do a control space, you should get the IntelliSense pop-up. Wait for children. There, now we know we'll make sure it's, it's taken care of. So, save that. We'll deploy. So if you add it in there when you're actually in the job by itself, will it, when you, when you go back and look at your, your control script, will it first, is it, you can lay that in there? No, it won't be in there. And if we go hit Java right now, it's gonna overwrite that. Yeah, if you that's, when we're, that's where we'll lose our code. That's, uh, that's where I was telling before. If you will, if you want to take control of this, you have to delete that end auto and begin auto generated <laughs> headers, and now Robot Builder will no longer manage this section of code for you. It's all it's all on you. When you push it again, it won't. It won't. Overwrite it won't overwrite it. Okay. It will happen. It will happen often. It, 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 it's going to get your coder a couple of times. And like, oh, where'd all my code go? And you have to redo it. <laughs> Fortunately, and I already hit, I auto hit him. When you in, when you install this code, uh, VS Code, it's going to uh, when you're in VS Code and you hit that uh, Java button again. Underneath every one of these object or these uh, files, you're going to get a white file that says the exact copy of it with a tilde at the end. That is a backup of the last time, right before Robot Builder took care of it. So if you lose it, you have a backup you can get at. That bothers me seeing that it muddies up everything. So there is a way to hide it. And I do have it on those handouts. If, you, if you're new to this one, you didn't get a handout before, make sure you take a handout. There's a little pro tip on there to how to hide those. It bugs me. They're still there. You can go find them. So in Teleop, we're going to enable our robot. And we should have got a new button, command group one right there. We can execute try that new command. So let's the valve hooked up to the pump. Hooked up to the pump. Oh. Oh. Good call. Good call. I have that in my hand. I expect, I expect there to be a delay right here, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. Just run it. Yep. Zero, zero. Ran for 10 seconds. I'm not telling you, but it'll do the end. Seven, eight, nine. Rift went down. Drive to five. Drive to five. went up and it continued to drive. And then ran for when half of it there. There's the magic. And it worked that time, what, worked I that time. what I was expecting. The PEID with a PEID controller, there is a range. If you, if you have to be right, right, on, the right on the mark, you set that tight, you set that tight range in there. So apparently it's, so apparently it's 231. Not, but if we're not quite yeah. getting to our set point, it will hang on that, on that command. Not it will not move on until it gets to that point. So either you have to dollar your PID in a little tighter, or we will show you how to set up a watchdog timer on there. Disable. Back so, back one. You're gonna have to manually go in there. So let's go look at the, all at the end of our very first risk to set point. We're gonna cl we're gonna click in there, and right after risk to set point zero, we're gonna put a comma. Right here. Yep. And a number. Let's just say we know this is always gonna happen within one second or two seconds. So we'll put a timeout in there. So. If this command does not finish for some reason, we don't want our code to hang up right here. We want it to continue on. Maybe it's just getting there, but not quite there. Why have your robot sit on the field for that? So you put some timeouts in there and your expected amount of time it's gonna take so it doesn't hang. It happened to us in Stronghold a couple times. That's when we discovered this one. It happened, in, it happened in Steamworks too. Trying to place the, it wouldn't turn when we tried to place the peg. It wouldn't turn all the way, so it'd stop. Yeah, I think that's because we, we wanted to make sure we we're there. Yes. It's just part of those add sequential add parallels. It's, I mean, it's a variable that gets taken into those. Yes. Okay. So what, what's happening inside there? And actually, um, click on the add sequential, AJ. Just click once. Do, a control, uh, do an F12. Here's all the constructors for that. So we have add sequential. There's a method right here for command and a timeout. Th this is overloaded, so somewhere in here, go back to that other tab, somewhere in there. Click on the one underneath it. 
F12 that one. And we're right here, the same add sequential, but it only accepting one parameter. So when you're programming, you have methods that have different variable patterns, but it's the same constructor that's called overloading, and it just depends on how you program it. So we're just taking advantage of that other. So either will work in that case, or how? Either will work, is you're just not gonna have that benefit of the time mode. If that command is not finished, yep. that's where your robot's going to yep. stop. Pardon me? Do it for add parallel. Add a, see if there's a time for add parallel AG. I'm pretty sure there is. Oh, actually, just add it. Go to do it. Go to that thing, and I'm really sorry. Do, do, do a comma at one after that. Yeah. Yeah, it's so now we could actually some of these. What, you broke something. Huh? Maybe you could left it there. We start building all these different commands and all these you know, different functionalities that are, we can now s link these together in different chunks and use an auto chooser. And I, we're kind of out of time to this, too, but once we said there's some good tutorials on how to set the auto cho choosers and set the dashboard to pick your autos and what you're going to do. There's also one more. Let's do it real quick. Go to uh, Robot Builder. Can't push out anything from Robot Builder. It'll break it. It's just going to take that. Uh, uh, wait, for wait, that's fine. Add a new command. The regular command? No, nope, we're going to do a conditional command at the bottom. What this does is it actually adds a, at runtime, if you try to do a conditional like halfway through your command, your sequential commands, when this was constructed, that's the data it's acting upon. So at the beginning of the match, when, when your robot actually booted up, it would go out and look for FMS data and wouldn't get anything, so it wouldn't have anything to work upon. So your if you did an like if this then that, it would it would break. So this conditional command is kind of an at runtime condition. At the top, we'll just leave that there. On true command, let's let's assign a, these aren't we won't be right, but let's add drive time. And then if false, let's add uh, the risk to set point. Parameters time out. Parameter go parameter preset. I think we're gonna have to set. Okay, just put drive with joysticks on uh, false. I don't want it. I kind of let them think. Nothing's going to be there. That's fine. Let's uh, save this, deploy. Uh, wait for children. It's going to disappear. Wait for children. It's going to disappear, which is fine. We knew. We know that. The conditional command is broken. The new command there. Is we have to go write some code inside there. Why is that one broken? Why like Oh, the drive time needs to come. Put a five inside the parentheses. Good caller. It does need a five. Scroll down. Here's the condition. We can now write some code in here. If FMS data character one equals uh, R, do the true command. Otherwise, it's going to do the false command. So we can write a condition. Quite literally, return. Go to the F. Where? Right so right where the false is. Delete the false. Actually, delete all that. Just delete this whole line? Yeah. We're going to go if, lowercase if, then parentheses, if true, just put write the letter lowercase true inside there. Put in there. Yeah. I don't have anything to act upon. Do the squiggly, enter, return, true, uh, print, uh, uh, colon. And underneath there, on, uh, underneath that squiggly bracket. Underneath this one? Yeah, right there now type else, right next to it. That's just the way I like it. Else, squiggly, return false. So now, if whatever value's in there is true, it's gonna run the, the true command, otherwise it's gonna run the false command. And this is where our, our, our autonomous has got really busy last year. We have. Do we want to run a two cube? Do we not want to run a two cube? Do we want to go across the field? Do we want to stop halfway across the field? Do we want to go into the null territory? Do we not want to stop short of the null territory? We had a lot of decisions that we had to do. And as we worked with our alliance partners, we could configure our auto just with choosers to work well with whatever path that they're robot. Most of them could, we're going to cross field or we're going to do this. Well then, we're going to put one up there, but we want two cubes on that scale. We're going to go in the null territory. 
But if you're not going to cross field, we're going to go to the corner and we're going to try to get our second cue. We're going to try our two cue bottle. So it was a lot, a lot of those things that we use this command, this system for. Kind of the end. Any questions? More? Make sure you grab a yes. Um, what is that? Um, boolean tag. The boolean. Boo a boolean is a true or false. Yes or no. So what this is. Protected, it just means it's not exposed to the rest of the robot program. It's going to return a value, boolean, which is true, false. Uh, you, you could do, when it's a protected void, it's not going to return any value. You could do a public double, and it's going to return maybe an encoder value or gyro value, something along those lines. Other questions? All right, well, thank you. Make sure you grab a a slip there with uh, some of those pro tips. There's some links to the Twitch feeds on there, as well as there's on the back side of the VS Code uh, talk, where there you know, there's some other pro tips on VS Code. So thank you again.